Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Dean Tinney. I'm coming to you from my studio in fabulous Las Vegas. Uh, I've been wanting to beef up our content available for our 65, 66 candidates. Uh, I put a very brief summary of the Uniform Securities Act, which I try to make as target rich as possible in the you know study block time of an hour and an hour, hour and a half that I shoot for in these lectures. Uh, but, uh, and there's a 50 question explicated uh, practice questions on some of the most complicated concepts, only, you know, seven or eight questions on 65, 66, but 50, 50 practice questions just to get you comfortable. So uh, what I want to do today is actually give you a full blown uh, lecture on investment advisory firms and investment advisory reps. I eventually want to have coverage on the entire exam. And I was originally thinking about explicating, and I still do that, the test specifications from both 65 and 66. Um, and I looked at it and there's just no flow. I mean, that's really just the, the state administrators. They're, you know, they're legal professionals. It's all in legalese. So, I thought, you know, I got to impose some flow. So my game plan is to get this lecture for you. And then uh, I'll have another lecture on unethical business practices, which is very target rich. And then on the investment component, we have most of that covered already in uh, investment lectures, but I'll put up a, a different explication on 66 and 65 of the uh, the investment questions that are unique to that. So that's kind of the game plan. At that point, I will feel like uh, there's enough content there. I felt like we've been pretty skinny. All right, so today's discussion, we're gonna talk about who regulates a registered investment advisory firm. It's either gonna be a federally covered investment advisory firm or a state covered. It's never both. You know, it used to be both and you know, uh, Investment advisory firms have enough push to, under the National Securities Market Improvement Act, come up with a category called federally covered investment advisory firms and uh, federally covered securities. We're concerned here with the firm. And so then we're also going to talk about uh, investment advisor reps. That would be you taking your 65 or 66. And as you see here, we're either going to be SEC or uh, state. Definition of an investment advisor. So you know, the classical way to remember this, let me get a, is A, B, C. Do I tell people I give investment advice? Do I tell people I'm in the business of giving investment advice and I want compensation? A, B, C. That's the classical kind of thing people use to determine whether or not you're an investment advisory firm. And remember, if you are, that means that you're going to have to uh, register. Uh, again, a big part of your exam is legal component, right? About half, 63, it's all. And one of the concepts in law is this idea of natural or unnatural persons. So you can really get hung up on the uh, grammar. What do you mean my firm's a person? The firm you are associated with is an unnatural person. You know, meaning it's a legal entity, it has uh, rights, but it's not a living, breathing human being. You know, uh, Mitt Romney got a, a little hot water when he didn't express this quite correctly, but he said, you know, corporations are people too. <laughs> what he meant was that they're unnatural persons. You know, we had an investment advisory firm uh, federally covered that uh, pled to a felony, but the guy who ran that, the 65 said, I'm not pleading to a felony. You know, he understands that you can't throw an unnatural person, the investment advisory firm in jail, but you most certainly can throw the natural person, living, breathing human being in jail. So in securities law, persons are capable of issuing, dealing in, and investing in securities such as the following and can be held accountable. That's the key word, can be held accountable in law. Individual natural persons, they can be held accountable, living, breathing human beings. Businesses can be held accountable. Now, for exam purposes, again, this is not unique to the uh, Uniform Securities Act or the Investment Advisor Act of 1940. Minors can't be held legally accountable for their behavior. That's true on this exam in any uh, area of law. People who are deceased can't be held accountable for their actions. True in law and on this particular exam uh, in law. And those who've been declared by a court to be mentally incompetent can't be held accountable for their actions. And on your exam, make sure you know what is not a person, meaning they can't be held uh, legally accountable. Exclusions from the definition. Now be careful on this. You know, one of the challenges is these uh, laws and regulations that we're talking about come from like the 1950s. You know, and if you watch It's a Wonderful Life, one of the best movies on banking ever made, uh, the savings and loan there, the guy who runs it is probably the most financially sophisticated guy in town. In a lot of rural communities, that's still true. 
And so if I'm just a traditional banker and I'm at the Kiwanis Club and somebody asks me what they should do and I say, you know, you ought to avail yourself of professional management, diversification and uh, ease of ownership, you should buy a mutual fund. Now, assuming I'm not sending you to a subsidiary of the bank that has a registered person, I just told you to buy a mutual fund. Well, then, you know, I'm not an investment advisor. It's, it's the keyword you're looking for on the exam, by the way, is incidental. You know, I'm giving advice, but it's, you know, not what I'm charging you for. You just assume that I would know because I'm a sophisticated kind of banker guy. Now, most of us today, remember, you know, set up a holding company. You can refer to my other lecture on this. And this holding company would have different subsidiaries. And now we're not talking about a situation where there's a bank and the bank holding company has not only a bank, but it has a RIA, a wealth management division. It has a broker dealer. That is not what we're talking about. We're just talking about a bank and it's a bank. It doesn't do any of this other stuff that we are going to be talking about. Again, the key word here is incidental. So that's the word you're looking for on your exam, incidental. So I'm a lawyer. Good mnemonic. I wish we had more mnemonics for the exam, but uh, unfortunately, we don't. I mean, so you know, there's not a lot of uh, things you can hang these threads on. They, you know, like I say, I think one of the most challenging things in the 63, 65, 66 is a lack of flow. There's just not really any flow to it. You know, but if I'm a uh, lawyer, you know, there's a lawyer right there. And, uh, you know, uh, I won a $300 million uh, lawsuit for you, personal injury. Uh, $100 million for me, $200 million for you. And you say, Dean, what should I do? And I say, well, you should uh, call my insurance guy about a fixed annuity. Or you should call my investment professional. Again, as long as that advice I'm giving you is incidental, then I don't need to be licensed investment advisor. Now, I can tell you, I have all kinds of attorneys that show up in 65 classes because they cross the line of incidental. Now they're charging for investment advice. But as long as it's incidental, again, accountant, I said, I'm going to reflect on your tax return that you're funding an IRA. So, you know, you need to find an investment professional and fund that thing and, uh, you know, buy a mutual fund. That's again, incidental. I'm not charging you for investment. I'm not a registered rep. I'm not an investment advisor. I'm just accountant. Now, remember in today's world, this could be a challenge because everywhere's different hats. We're talking about this is the only hat they're wearing and the investment advice they're giving is incidental. You know, a teacher, you know, uh, I teach financial things, but, you know, back in the day, if I wasn't busy, I'd set up at the high school and Every once in a while, somebody would ask me for investment advice, maybe a fellow teacher, and I say, you ought to buy a mutual fund. I just gave advice, but it's incidental. I didn't charge for it. I'm not a registered rep. And so again, people think teachers, you know, might know something about investments. They're more than welcome to share that to people. They don't need to be registered as an investment advisor rep. By the way, you can't be a rep without a firm. So it's kind of, you know, catch 22 there. And then an engineer, you know, if I'm Bechtel, Bechtel is a major engineer firm. They've got oil refineries and airports and things like that, billion, billion, multi-billion dollar projects. And they might say, you know, you need some uh, investment. Like, Here's my advice for you. Uh, you need to call Goldman Sachs and talk to an infrastructure banker. Again, I just gave investment advice. It's in incidental. Now, you know, Bechtel's developed so much expertise. They say, listen, you don't need to call uh, Goldman. You can call Bechtel Capital Management. You know, Bechtel Capital Management is now something, an entity that gives investment advice that's lose the exclusion because it's no longer incidental. So good, uh, good uh, thing is this late and keyword incidental. Boy, I'll jo joke with you a bit. 63, 65, 66 is a giant reading test. Investment advisor exclusions, people who are excluded from having to register with either the SEC or the state, uh, broker dealers with no special compensation. This is the traditional models, 763 or 663, where I say, listen, you know, uh, my investment advice to you is free. And sometimes that advice is that you invest in, for example, a mutual fund. And at the point you invest in a mutual fund, then my broker dealer receives compensation and I get a percentage of that. That's the traditional model. That's considered incidental. I don't need to be, you know, 65, 66. I don't need to be affiliated with an investment advisory firm. Now, a lot of you are probably taking this exam because your broker dealer has an affiliated investment advisory firm. You know, in the traditional model, you said, well, Dean, I'm not comfortable with the traditional model. I said, what do you mean? Uh, I think it's unlikely you're going to tell me to do nothing because do nothing means no transaction, means no, you know, commission or work up or markdown. I said, well, I would hope that, you know, the answer is do nothing, that I would tell you to do nothing. But, you know, that might be the end of the story. But I say, hey, 
Did I tell you that I also am an investment advisory representative of an affiliated investment advisory firm, my broker dealer? And if you want, we can wrap my products and services into a fee. Fee. Now we're talking about an investment advisory firm. We're talking about a 65 and the 66 and that keyword fee. You know, broker dealers, traditional broker dealers, that traditional model don't charge fees. We charge markup, markdowns, or, you know, commissions. Uh, publishers do not need to uh, register as investment advisor as long as it's general regular circulation. What we mean by that is, you know, Wall Street Journal, New York Times, USA Today have investment advice columns. I find them very uh, helpful. You know, I read it and they tell me about 529s and the difference between a 529 and a Coverdale. And, you know, but I don't put my you know, money into the newspaper rack. I'm dating myself or get the newspaper because I plan on getting rich. You know, all those publishers I just brought up are general regular circulation. Now, if on the other hand, uh, I charge you $995 for Dean's Micro Maven or Dean's Microcap uh, Prudent Speculator, you know, I'm charging you $995 and I'm telling you about asset allocation, what stocks to buy or sell. Well, then I'm an investment advisory firm and I need to be set up as such. Now, if you're solely advising on government securities, and then remember, kind of a trick on the test, be careful on the grammar. You are not an investment advisor. You are an investment advisor representative. And so be careful when you're reading questions. Is the question about you or is the question about your firm? Because those are different questions. Sometimes the answer is the same, but in many circumstances, it could be different. So uh, federally covered investment advisors excluded from state registration under the Uniform Securities Act. As we said, you're either going to go register with either the feds or the state. Never both. You're exempt from registration as investment advisor uh, with the SEC, then well, then you would register with the state. And so typically, if you're an intrastate advisor, you only operate within one single state, you would register with the state and not the SEC. If your only clients are insurance companies, you would typically register with the state and not the SEC. So the state administrator says, Dean, how come I have not heard of your investment advisory firm? How come you did not register the firm with me, the state administrator? I said, well, I availed myself of the de minimis. I availed myself of the de minimis. I have no place of business in your state and I have fewer than six retail clients in your state in the preceding uh, 12 months. Now make sure, I'm not sure I should tell you the you know, things that most people were afoul of. RTFQ means read the full question. You know, be careful. There is no such thing as a de minimis for a broker dealer. A broker dealer has one customer and a retail customer in a state, that broker dealer needs to be registered. So this de minimis is only available for investment advisory firms not registering in a state where they have no place of business and they have fewer than six retail customers. So a uh, state administrator says, why don't we know about your investment advisory firm? I say, I have no place of business in your state. I only deal with institutions, broker dealers, and other investment advisors who are capable of protecting their own their own assets. This is all about protecting retail investors, retail investors. The Uniform Securities Act, the state administrator, that's who they really care about. You know, Joe Sixpack, so to speak. Again, the state administrator says, Dean, why don't I know about your investment advisory firm? I said, well, I'm only calling on my customers who are snowbirds. You know, uh, my firm is from Minnesota. I'm registered in Minnesota, but you know, a lot of uh, my clients at the winter, you know, get out of here, they fly to Nevada or Arizona and, uh, you know, they're snowbirds. And so I tell the state administrator of Arizona and, uh, you know, Nevada, I said, well, no, listen, those, those aren't your residents, they're residents of the state in which I am, don't you love that word domicile? That just is the legal term for saying where, you know, my headquarters is or where my firm is at. So a snow, snowbird exception. As I said, you register with either the state or the SEC, never both. And it's generally based on AUM, assets under management. Now, I highly recommend it. Anytime you hear an acronym, you just spell it out. So every time I hear AUM, I say assets under management. If you're 100 to 10, 10 million or more, you're going to register with the SEC. 100 million to 110, if you are 100 million or more, you can choose 
whether you want to be state or SEC. Now, most investment advisory firms would choose SEC because it's it allows you to do a lot more things and, you know, it's one instead of a lot. So, but, you know, uh, whatever, right? So uh, 110 million or more SEC, 100 to 110 SEC or state. I said 100 million to 110, you know, you, you as the investment advisory firm can choose. Uh, 100 million, it says greater than 100, only unless there's some exception. So an exception available to me is uh, not based on AUM, but I say the reason I didn't register with you, the state, even though my AUM says I should have, is because it would have caused me to have to register my investment advisory firm in 15 or more states. And so I'm gonna be an SEC federally covered investment advisor. I only manage registered investment companies. That's the fancy word for a mutual fund, right? I manage a thing I'm exempt again. Yeah, you because know, the mutual fund I'm managing is capable of protecting its own interest. I expect to reach hundred million within 120 days. You know, a lot of times we uh, lose some of our portfolio managers uh, who are managing mutual funds to, to this uh, thing. They set up their own investment advisory firm. You know, and if I leave, you know, Fidelity or whatever and say, I'm going to set up uh, Dean Tinney Capital Management, uh, minimum investment, 50 million uh, with a five-year lockup. The assumption is Dean's going to be over a hundred million pretty quickly. And then again, I would be federally covered. Love this little uh, graph here. And let me get a different color here. So we said here, between here and here, you, you choose. We said, if you're an SEC, it's never both, remember. Uh, it's either one or the other. And then we said below here, it's state. And we talked about that exemption there. We said the buffer is uh, 20 million. Uh, once they are SEC registered, uh, there's a floor at 90. So as long as you don't dip below that 90, I think the previous slide showed that to us. Oh, I guess it didn't. If I were doing this over, I'd put a 90 there, but I would definitely know that floor. That's the way I think of it as a floor of 90. You know, so the assets decline, people, you know, uh, leave you, whatever. Uh, federally covered registered dean not registered with the states. However, they may be required to pay fees. So as we said, the state administrators didn't like the, uh, the state administrators in the Uniform Securities Act are the equivalent of the SEC within their state. Don't tell anybody I said this, but you know, the SEC in our business is God, state administrators think they are. And so, you know, they're there to protect their, their residents of their state. Anyways, as I mentioned, the National Securities Market Improvement Act uh, took a lot of power away from the states. And so, you know, to kind of throw them a little bit of a bone, we said, listen, federally covered advisors will not have to register with you. I know you're a little upset with that. However, we'll make sure that if you have any fees that need to be paid, that they will certainly continue to pay those. Made a little more okay for them. Form ADV is very testable. Form ADV is very testable. So we're going to file a Form ADV. This is how we register. So exclude, assuming we're not excluded as a firm from being an investment advisory firm, assuming we give investment advice, we tell people we're in the business of giving investment advice, we want compensation, we're going to file Form ADV Part 1 and Part 2. Part 1 and Part 2. Part one will include the business name and form of ownership as a test question. Now that form of ownership is testable on two levels. It's not only testable on the regulatory side, but it's also testable on the investment side about types of clients we may have. We're saying, how are we setting this up? You know, my firm, my investment advisory firm was called Gamma Global Investment Advisors and its form of ownership was an LLC. So, you know, they wanna know, are you an LLC? Are you a subchapter S? Are you a, a partnership? Are you a C Corp? And as I said, this is a best uh, uh, testable on two levels. So I would know here we mean form of ownership of the firm, but I'd also know that, uh, you know, LLCs, subchapter S's, partnerships have a flow through of the tax consequences. The LLC, the uh, subchapter S partnership doesn't pay taxes, it'll have distributions to its owners. And the you know income or losses will flow through, whereas a C corp has retained earnings, right? So that's testable not only in the present uh, slide here, but also in uh, investments as types of customers. So on the form ADV Part One A, we want to know past five years business, current affiliations of the control persons, and then the change in control that's testable as well. Change in control. Let me clean up my slide here. Uh, change in control is also gonna require an amended uh, Form U4. 
you know, that is very much a test issue. Educational background, nature of the business. And this is a testable as well, a balance sheet from an independent public account. Uh, on your form ADV, you're gonna tell them what kind of authority you're gonna have over your client's funds. Are you gonna have discretion? You know, what kind of discretion? Are you gonna have a custody? Are you gonna use a broker dealer for custody? Whatever that may be. We wanna know what is your compensation going to be? A percentage of the assets under management, which is typical. You know, my firm, I would charge people 1% of assets under management. But if you're gonna have performance-based compensation, you know, that person is going to have to have a million dollars in assets under management with the advisory firm or a 2.1 million net worth. I wouldn't worry too much about the numbers. The main point is this idea about NASA and this thing about a benchmark. So every time I get an acronym, I'd spell out the North American Securities Administrator Association requires that an investment advisory firm disclose to clients who are paying their investment advisory firm performance-based compensation, that that gives the investment advisory incentive to take greater risk, right? Because I'm not risking the investment advisory firm's money, I'm risking the client's money. And so NASA requires that disclosure. NASA further requires that we uh, tell them what is our benchmark for this performance-based compensation. You know, I'm gonna use the S&P 500, for example, if I'm a large cap equity fund or, or advisor, excuse me, or a small cap advisor, Russell 2000. So if it's gonna be based on some index, I have to tell you why I chose that index and why it's the most appropriate in, in, in index is a benchmark. I'll tell you about a criminal record if I have one, the portion of devoted uh, provided to investment advice. You know, it, it, at my firm, I tell you very little of uh, my time is spent on the investment advisory uh, side. You know, we have a, a broker dealer affiliate that does investment banking and that's where the vast majority of my time is gonna be spent as well as the rest of the resources of the, the holding company that owns the broker dealer. Or, you know, hey, oh, this is all I do full time. I, I'm an investment advisory firm. So how much is not, you know, Carl Icahn set up an investment advisory firm. And, you know, he said, listen, it's mainly about me managing money, but if you want to come along for the ride, that's fine. Very testable. I don't know of any draw. TQ just means test question. It doesn't mean you're going to get verbatim that test question. It just means, you know, expect a test question in this area. Very high probability. So consent to service is if I can't find the firm, by the way, this is for everybody, not only just the firm, but the investment advisor representative or the broker dealer or agents of the broker dealer, consent to service means the state administrator can accept legal documents on your behalf. The you know, natural person's behalf or the natural person's behalf. What we're basically saying here is you can't hide from a subpoena or you know hide from being served. Right, because if I can't find you, I'm just going to serve the invest uh, the state administrator, and the firm or the individual is considered served. Uh, very much a test issue on the exam. Form uh, ADV Part One B is for state registered advisors only, and uh, you know that's just the extent of what they want to know. One B is for state registered only. You pay a filing fee. Now, I would want you to know everything, but assuming you can't know everything. You know, uh, the state is always more important uh, for your test taking success than the feds because it's the North American Securities Administrator Association states that are requiring you to take this exam. So your registration is effective noon of the 30th day, uh, 45 for the SEC and state registration. This is the one date that is kind of common. I would know that date. So even if you don't get it here, you know, just for everywhere, if you have a choice and one of your choices is December 31st, uh, I would take it. Right? So it expires December 31st and you know, you, uh, you have to pay your fees over again. Form ADV part two is a disclosure brochure. So you, you can use a separate brochure if you want, but if you're going to use a separate brochure, you better make a damn sure that whatever was found in the form ADV uh, part two would be found in that brochure. So part two A describes the firm, the investment advisory firm, the unnatural person, Form ADV Part 2B uh, discloses information about the personnel. Like, the whole point here is so you can make an informed investment decision, right? So, you know, that's all about helping people make informed decisions. And this brochure is going to help them uh, make that decision. Uh, it has to be updated annually. We deliver to clients. So, 
you know, I'm coming out to call on a doctor perhaps, and I hope to, uh, you know, I'm soliciting him. I'm hoping to sign him up as a client of my investment advisory firm. And so uh, he's a prospect. So I'm coming out to call on him and I send him the current brochure. So I either send it to him. If he, I get it 48 hours in advance to him, uh, the doctor in this hypothetical isn't going to have a free look period. But if you know I don't get it to him 48 hours, he has a five business day right to rescind. I kind of think of that as a free look. That's not really a test term, but you know, if I'm trying to sign him up and he says, geez, Dean, this investment advisory contract, ooh, you know, I'd like to have my attorney look it over. You know, I don't feel comfortable signing it. And I say, well, you know, doctor, as you know, I just handed it to you over the, your desk here. And so, you know, you have five business days to rescind. So if you're comfortable, let's just go ahead and get it signed and documented and let's get uh, busy. And, you know, you're what you say, you're meeting your attorney tomorrow, whatever to go over it. Fine. You have five days to rescind without a penalty. If there are material changes, now that's a key word as well in your exam. You know, material means something that would alter somebody's decision. Now, if you're saying that you want to stay out of trouble, you would say it was immaterial. I didn't think it would alter their decision. I saw the security professional being interviewed. And he said, what well, was asked why he didn't tell the person this information. And he said, I thought I'd lose the sale. I said, man, I can't think of any worse answer than that. That's the all time worst answer. I say, listen, it may uh, alter your investment decision, but something you ought to know. So if there's a material change, we deliver it to each client within 120 days at the end of the year. A free current brochure always has to be available. Free is testable. I can't charge you for my brochure. <laughs> Listen, I know some investment advisory firms that, you know, their, their materials are probably a hundred bucks. And just the brochure that, remember, still has all the information of Form ADV, just much prettier. A summary of material changes to the brochure and offering to provide that updated brochure. We can deliver it electronically, but if there's no material change, well, you know, we don't need to do, uh, do this, right? It's no news is good news, so to speak. You know, in my investment advisory practice, uh, sometimes people would say, Dean, instead of you deducting that out of my account, can I just prepay you in advance? Uh, my investment advisory firm was state registered. Uniform Securities Act means state. By the way, every time I see USA, it's a Uniform Securities Act, and I think state. And I would say no. And the reason Dean would say no to that is I say, well, listen, if I collect an advance from you, prepayment of an investment advisor fee, I'm creating a contingent liability. I'm charging you for services I have not yet rendered to you, and I don't want to have contingent liabilities. Uh, you know, something that, you know, I'm charging an advance for. So my answer would be no. You know, you're, you don't have more stringent rules. Now, if I said, yes, I'm gonna let you write me a separate check for the investment advisory fees and let you prepay me so it doesn't come out of your Schwab account. I was using Schwab Institutional Group for my execution and custody. And so I'm deducting the 1% out of your Schwab account. That was the only way I would agree to conduct business with you. But that being said, if I did that, you're entitled to a balance sheet of my investment advisory firm to make sure whether or not it looks like Dean is a property, properly capitalized to you know, uh, you know, make good on this contingent liability. Now it's 500 on the state side, 1200 on the uh, federal side. And again, would I like you to know everything? I would, but if you can only know one, the state is more important for your success than as the federal. Uh, disclosure of material legal, again, that word material. You know, uh, we had a investment advisory firm. <laughs> it was about a $2 billion you know, issue. And uh, he said, it's not material. So it's relative to the size of the firm. Right? <laughs> you know, in my world, 2 billion would be material. But material means it's something that would alter your decision about having my investment advisory firm manage your money. So disclosure of material legal or disciplinary action, including fines of $2,500 or more. A prompt amendment for those material changes. Now, you know, we sometimes tell you what that, that is, sometimes we don't. So when we don't give it to you, you know, it's pur pur uh, purposely left vague, purposely left vague. Uh, I don't have to deliver the brochure if my clients are mutual funds, investment companies, because, you know, they're capable of protecting their own assets, their own interest. And the state administrator isn't worried about people who are charging $495 for a newsletter or some sort about investments. 
I mean, in the, the scheme of things, if you lose $495 by buying some, you know, newsletter that it provides in personal advice, I'm not sitting down with you. I'm just telling you in general what people should do. The state administrator doesn't really, you know, worry too much about that. By the way, that uh, $500 is a common number as well, right? So, you know, so far we had a couple, you know, if you get, some people like to have like cheat sheets or whatever you want to call it, data dump. It doesn't, this test doesn't really lend itself well to that, but there is some things, you know, that, uh, you know, are a common thread, right? Not many, unfortunately. So investment advisor contracts on brochures, the investment advisory contract, whether it's federally covered or state, is going to have to say the services to be provided, the uh, duration of the contract, the advisory fee, the formula for computing that advisory fee, doing it you know, quarterly, you know, however we do it. The amount of the prepaid fee to be returned, whether discretion is uh, granted, no waiver of underperformance. I can't say, hey, I let myself down and let you down. So, uh, you know, this year, my firm is not going to charge you an investment advisory fee. No, no, no. I can't imagine any draw of your exam and where you don't get tested on this idea that you can't uh, assign an investment advisory contract. I mean, if I hired your firm to manage my money, you know, you can't assign that contract to some other firm without my permission. It's very testable. By the way, you know, you're going to get questions too about what constitutes a change in control. You know, and, you know, again, is the change in control going to be material or immaterial? So here we go, right? Notification of changes only when the change is to a minority interest. Notification and if a majority interest changes, it's considered assignment. So here we're just saying you make notification if it's not change in control. And then here it would be considered consent. So notification, consent, you know, because you get to say, eh, I don't like the, you know, new majority owners. Uh, investment advisor contracts, again, uh, we just did that. It looks like I had a duplicate side there. Yeah, boom. Uh, Raft free brochure. So a lot of you are getting your uh, 766s or your 663-65s or your uh, 763-65s. You know, if you're just getting a 65, you just work at a fee-based investment advisory firm. So you wouldn't be, you know, dealing with wraps. You know, for example, Fisher Investments is a fee-based investment advisory firm. They don't have any broker dealer affiliate. So all the men and women at, uh, you know, Fisher have 65s. But there's a lot of us who are uh, agents of a broker dealer as well as an investment advisor representative of an affiliated investment advisory firm. And we wrap our products and services into a fee. And again, this is very testable, particularly on 66. So that wrap fee brochure tells you what's included in the wrap and what's excluded. Very important that we tell you what's included in the wrap fee, how many trades, how many research reports, and what is excluded, not included. You know, for example, insurance perhaps. So what's in there? So we tell you that uh, a la carte may have been cheaper for you. You say, Dean, I've heard about these wrap accounts and you know, why haven't you put me in a wrap account? And I said, well, if we wrap my products and services into a fee, you would have paid me more than what you paid me for the transactions. And so I left you in a transaction-based compensation model because that was better for you, right? Or, you know, why didn't I put you in that when I should have? So you know, here what we're talking about is we're supposed to help the client if we have various different business models, you know, tell the help the client, you know, act and hit the client's best interest to uh, pick whatever the right model may be. So broker dealers can be hired as third party solicitors. So this third party solicitor thing is uh, something that drives me nuts because I spent, uh, you know, uh, part of my career as a third-party solicitor. Gamma Global Investments, my broker-dealer, was a third-party solicitor. And I, I can tell from a lot of the study materials and other people like Dean who teach this, they're not quite clear on this. Now, the thing they're not quite clear on wouldn't cause you to miss any questions. And my explanation to you wouldn't cause you to miss any questions either. But, you know, here I'm going to give you a brochure about the solicitor, the broker-dealer. I'm going to give you the name of the federally covered investment advisor. 
So, you know, my situation, the broker dealer was called Dama Global Investments. So that's the name of the solicitor. This tells you about my broker dealer. The name of the federally covered investment advisor, Carlisle, TBG, Blackstone, whatever the case may be. The nature of the relationship between the broker dealer and the federally covered investment advisor. What is my re relationship? I find them, you know, clients. Sometimes in the business, not a test term, because that's called a placement agent. That is not a test term, but that's what these people are called, you know, in the in the business. So the fact that the solicitor will receive compensation. So I'd say, listen, I'm. It's unlikely I'm going to not tell you you should give your hundred million dollars to this federally covered investment advisor because, you know, I'm being compensated by them to go find them people like you. So very unlikely that I'm going to tell you that because I'm receiving compensation. If you invest $100 million with this federally covered investment advisor, my broker dealer gets 2% of that, 2 million. You know, the federally covered investment advisor charges you two and 20, 2% 2 of the assets under management, 20% of the profits they make you. And so what they're doing is paying my broker dealer that first 2% of the 100 million. So you're not gonna pay any higher fee by using the broker dealer to access the federally covered investment advisor than if you weren't, right? Or, you know, that was my model, so it didn't cost you anything else anymore. But I could have said, you know, it, it charges you 1% more to get access it through me, because, you know, now you're gonna pay 3%, two for them, one for the broker dealer, whatever the case may be. You know, I get a lot of people in 65 class who are soliciting on behalf of their investment advisory firm and they've been paid to try and push them into the $100 million category. Because remember, if you were $100 million category, then you can use broker dealers as third-party solicitors. So, you know, uh, only federal covered investment advisors can use broker dealers as third-party solicitors. So state registered investment advisory firms only can use their own folks and all those folks have a 65. Now, the other kind of trick here, let me see if I have that in my slide here. It doesn't look like it. Um, you know, on the broker dealer side, I could be working for the broker dealer and have a 763 working for that broker dealer and be raising money for a federally covered investment advisor. That is the only circumstance in which a natural person, a natural person is not going to have a 65. I mean, I may or may not, but the point is that 763 working for the third party solicitor can have a 763, doesn't necessarily have to be a 65. Uh, you know, as an investment advisory uh, firm, if I direct transactions to a particular broker dealer, they love me. You know, for example, uh, Fisher Investments has tens of billions of dollars at Schwab. There are dedicated Schwab teams to handle the investment advisory clients of Fisher. Those are investment advisory clients of Fisher's and broker dealer clients of Schwab. You know, uh, this guy in uh, La Jolla, that's where he's based, uh, uses TD Ameritrade. And he called TD Ameritrade and he said, hey, listen, I got these life insurance guys that I want to hook up with a 65 so that they can, you know, send referrals to me. I want to be able to solicit on behalf of my investment advisory firm. I'd like you, a broker dealer, to use some of the soft dollar compensation for me, my investment advisory firm, to pay for this seminar. And TD Ameritrade in this case said, yeah, we're going to pay for that. How much is the seminar? He said, well, you know, it's going to cost me, you know, about 6,000 bucks to, you know, send Dean up there for a three-day class. Um, fine. TD Ameritrade says, we'll take care of it. Now, listen, uh, we are all in Salt Lake City in winter in the snow. We'd all prefer to be in La Jolla. But uh, TD Ameritrade, the broker dealer, can't use soft dollar compensation to the investment advisory firm for test question travel. No rent and no non-customer related expenses. Now, the way to get this right on your test is what I call the Sesame Street trick. You know, one of these things is not like the other, right? So I said, you can pay for seminars, so you just gotta go through the uh, laundry list and pick out the one. This is what they test you on, is what the broker dealer cannot pay for. The broker dealer cannot pay for an investment advisory firm's travel cost, an investment advisory firm's rent, or investment advisory firm's expenses not related to the investment advisory clients who are also clients of the broker dealer. Other required filings. So we're gonna update our amendment to any amendment to the form ADV annually within 90 days of a uh, year end. We're gonna show what is our assets under management. 
were to pay the uh, appropriate annual fees. Uh, B, change in management, state of location, or form of business. Remember what this means in English? Form of business means we decide we're going to be, instead of a partnership, a C-corp. You know, we decide we want some retained earnings. We change our form of ownership. We have to file that form ADV uh, promptly, promptly. Uh, successor firm, because a merger acquisition. You know, I'm dating myself. I felt like I'm pretty old this morning, but, um, you know, Dean existed before there was a 65. <laughs> and when they came up with the 65, there were a lot of legendary portfolio investment advisors who had to go past the 65. And some of those living legends, I would say, well, listen, it's going to be embarrassing if you don't pass the 65 and be embarrassing for me as your tutor that you don't pass. But uh, listen, I don't think you're going to struggle on the investment advisory side. I mean, you know, on the investment part, you got that. But you might struggle a little bit on the regulatory side. Anyways, one of these legendary investment advisors sold her firm to Phoenix Asset Management. So Phoenix Asset Management has acquired what was called Seneca Capital Management. Gail Seneca, living legend, is retiring. So they're going to file a new application and they don't have to pay any additional fees. I would know we don't need to pay any additional fees. Uh, net worth requirements for state registered investment advisors. So if you have discretion only, no custody, 10 grand. So, you know, I used to tell um, my investment advisory clients, you know, I can't steal what I don't touch. I don't have your monies and securities. I'm using Schwab for execution and custody. They're the ones who have your funds and securities, not me. In that case, my investment advisory firm's net worth requirement is $10,000. Now, if I have custody of funds and securities, then my number is 35 grand. Again, I think the grammar in English on this thing is tough. You know, when I get candidates with English as a second language, I say, man, it's even tougher because I don't even think this thing is in English to begin with. I mean, it's in you know 1950s, 40s, you know, legalese. Anyways, that being said, as I told you in my example of my firm, the only thing I could do at Schwab is deduct my investment advisory fee. I don't have the authority to call Schwab and cut checks and send them to places. Some investment advisory firms do. You know, if that's all I do is this, there's Dean again, I'm still at 10 grand. So it's not considered custody that I can call Schwab and say, deduct out of my customer's account, my, uh, you know, 1%. That's the only thing I can deduct out of your Schwab account is the fee to my investment advisory firm. That keeps me at 10. If I'm only advising pooled investment vehicles, I'm at 10 because again, they're capable of protecting their own interests. And then you can uh, have a surety bond instead of this net worth requirement if you choose to as a firm. By the way, that be careful, that's about the firm. That isn't about the investment advisor representative. Good news, you don't have any net worth requirement to do that, right? That's what I love about our business, right? Uh, if you fall below whatever that net worth requirement, uh, you should notify your administrator by the next business day. You file a financial report within one business day and you're gonna meet the requirements of a state wherever the home office is. So again, you are actually being tested on a template. The Uniform Securities Act is a template. It isn't the actual laws of your state. But you know, thank goodness, the North American Securities Administrator Association has said, if you pass the exam on that template, you're good to go in terms of all those states. You know, I was reading the uh, memoir of Tom Ricketts and he uh, got on the business before this uh, NASA template existed and he had to actually go take every state's version of this thing. So man, you know, thank goodness, right? So you meet whatever requirements of the state where your home office is. So if you have more than one office, it's where your home office is located that you're gonna meet the requirements. Uh, SEC registered, remember, only have to meet SEC requirements. Financial impairment means I may not be able to uh, make good on my you know, promise of money management for you, investment advisor. So it's disclosure, if we have discretion, we have custody, we require that, for, there's that $500 again. Now, would I like you to know, you know, both the federal and state, I would, but again, if you only have enough brain space for one, stay focused on, uh, you know, the state requirement. Uh, record keeping under state federal laws, you have to maintain records. Easily accessible means within 24 hours. 
So, you know, they love to be able to say it is, you know, uh, 8.45 this morning, I'll be back 8.45 tomorrow. And I expect you to be have this record. So that's what easily accessible means. So if it's off site, that's fine. But then, you know, you'd be better to be able to produce it in 24 hours. It's kept to the principal office for two years. And then, you know, you can keep it any way you want, but uh, stupid, but testable. You know, you're out of compliance. If the machine doesn't have a bulb, you can't read it, you can't copy it, you know. Schwab was telling me they uh, spent, saved millions of dollars by digitizing all the records. And they said one of the most expensive parts of the project was making sure that an examiner, whether it's NASA or FINRA or the FCC, could access that information without, you know, three-day seminars. So <laughs> since they have all the records, they're pristine, they're easy to get to. Sometimes they, they said examiners like to hang out at Schwab, you know, a lot more fun than other places. Material changes, remember that word is important on your exam. Prompt notice to the advisor and file amended uh, form ADV. Uh, partnership agreements, articles of incorporation, minutes, uh, any uh, predecessor for at least three years. And the supervised person. Now be careful on your exam. There's no such thing as a supervisor of 65. So if you're just getting a 65 and you work for a fee-based investment advisory firm, you know, like I said, Fisher Investments, there's no nine, 10 or 24, it's just everybody's a 65. And some 65s are more equal than other, they are supervisors. So we need a copy of their U4. If you leave, you gotta follow form ADVW. Uh, again, that 30th day is a common thread on the Uniform Securities Act. Again, I'd like you to know everything, but if you can only, you know, know one thing, stay focused on the Uniform Securities Act. You know, NASA is the one requiring you to take a 65, 66, or 63. It isn't the SEC that's requiring you to take this exam. All right, so we talked about the investment advisory firm, and now it's time to talk about you. The investment advisor representative. So investment advisor representatives are individuals, remember the other word for that? Natural persons, living, breathing human beings. Or the firm you work for is an unnatural person, not a living, breathing human being. And uh, they're gonna be supervised by uh, investment advisors, other 65s. So partners, officers, and directors with active roles should be uh, investment advisor representatives, 65s. Employees and associates making recommendations, managing accounts and soliciting should be 65s. Where the only exception to that soliciting thing would be a federally covered advisor using a third party that is a broker dealer. Uh, no separate, as we said, there's not a FINRA kind of registration. So 65s are just 65s and some of them are first among equals, so to speak, they are supervisors. Uh, the word you're looking for here is solely. So there's some key words on your exam and another one is solely clerical in nature. You know, uh, this is our receptionist, he or she, administrative personnel, uh, whoop. Uh, clerical administrative solely, uh, solely. Exemption under state law, again, it's the same exemption for you as a 65 as it is for your firm, right? So the state administrator says, how come I don't know about you as an investment advisor representative? You say, I have no place of business in the state and I have fewer than six retail clients in your state. Now be careful, five or less is the same as fewer than six. So, you know, champagne problem is not a real problem, but be careful on phraseology. And I remember the snowbird, so it's the same for you as an investment advisor, rep that exemption as it is for your firm. So I, I've been covering uh, Texas. Our home office is in San Mateo, California. We're a federally covered investment advisor and I cover Texas. I'm calling on you know attorneys and doctors and car dealers and the usual suspects, trying to solicit them to open accounts for us to manage. And you know I have a plane there and I fly out for my appointments and I stay overnight in a hotel. So I have no place of business in Texas, but then I decide I get with my uh, supervisor. And I say, you know, I think I could provide better coverage to Texas. So I didn't have all that travel time and travel expenses. I'd like to set up an office in Dallas and be located there so I can better solicit and service our clients in Texas. Boom. So now in my example, the 65 is gonna register with the state of Texas because we knew do now have a place of business, right? So as long as I don't have a place of business in Texas, I don't register in Texas. But if I maintain a place of business 
Then the state of Texas wants to know about me as a 65, not my firm. My firm isn't going to register with Texas, just myself. I'm going to let them know I'm, what I'm up to. Uh, you filled out a U4. Hopefully we're able to check everything. No, not testable. Every box no is a clean U4 in our business. Every box, any yes answer means a dirty U4. Some yes answers are dirtier than others. I wouldn't worry about this. That's not a test term. That's just an industry term. However, these are serious yes answers on your U4. Have you been convicted or even just arrested? A little different than the FINRA version. The state administrators are a little more, you know, uptight. You know, the state administrator is usually an attorney, right? And this is the, you know, being in our state where I spent most of my career, the state administrator was the Department of Corporations of California. And, you know, the attorney general is the one who's in charge of the Department of Corporations. And in those days, Kamala Harris was attorney general, right? You know, uh, usually the state administrator is an attorney and they want, you know, to do other things. And so they have a ladder of offices. So again, a little different than FINRA, which is an SRO. It's a kind of a different kind of a relationship. Uh, registration effective date, uh, again, not solely on passing your exam. It's not until you're granted registration. In the meantime, you know, you can do clerical things. We can use you as like an indentured servant. servant. So you're an investment advisor representative, that's you. Uh, you uh, terminate, you're no longer gonna be associated with the investment advisory firm. If you were an investment advisor uh, representative with a state covered advisor, your firm takes care of it, right? So you are with a state covered investment advisor, your firm takes care of it. If you're with a federally covered advisor, you're gonna notify the administrator. So remember my guy who's in Texas, I went to Texas, I have a 65, I opened up an office in Texas. My firm is federally covered, but remember I told the state of Texas that I have a location there. Then it's my responsibility as the 65 to notify the administrator. It's effective 30 days after receipt, but the administrator retains jurisdiction for a year. Again, common theme, the renewal date is December 31st. There, oh, excuse me, there is no net worth requirement for you as an individual. Kind of cool. I love our business, right? And it's a very well compensated business. And there is no requirement uh, for you as an individual. So uh, the way I would think about it, I know it's helpful. I would think there's no net worth requirement for natural persons. You know, the, the net worth requirement is for the unnatural person, the investment advisory firm. Uh, no record keeping except for material change and it's reported on your U4 within 30 days. I would know that. Now, what that means in English is any no answer on the U4 that becomes a yes answer that needs to be amended within 30 days. All right. Well, I, I'm pretty happy with that. We got this uh, lecture done and a little, it looks like a little under an hour. So that's where it fits into a study block. Let me tell you again, just review what I plan on doing to beef up. This is a major uh, investment into content on the channel for you, 63s, 65s, and 66s. So we have a, a brief summary of the Uniform Securities Act, which I think runs about an hour and three quarters and is target rich. I mean, that was the point of that lecture was to get something up there that I felt I could get you the most points. Uh, I'm going to put that in the playlist at like uh, number one. I'm going to put this number two. And then my plan is to uh, have a investment component on 66, uh, 65, a lecture, and I'll probably, you know, I'm contemplating how to do this, but I think what I'll do is explicate the, you know, a test specifications, just go through each of those investment items and tell you what the test is, because we have backup lectures for a lot of the investment content. So again, we now have on there for you an introduction to the exam, the uh, brief summary of the Uniform Securities Act, lots of investment content for 65s. Now we're going to throw this into the mix. So the next big lecture will be unethical business practices. That's a lots of performance opportunities, test questions. I call those performance opportunities on 63, 65, 66. Post that. And then at some point I'll circle back and take care of the investments. Uh, again, if you're watching this, it's too late to tell you this because you'll be watching and I'll be running a chat alongside it. But on all the premieres, regardless of whether it's 63, 65 or 66, there's always a live Q and A chat that I run for the premiere or answer any of the questions about the lecture itself or any other questions you have. So join us for a premiere, uh, you know, and if you wanna, you know, chat about the lecture we're watching as it premieres, 
or if you have anything else you want to do in uh, the live Q&A chat, that's fine too. All right.